Okay, so hi everyone. Thanks for attending the uh, Cybersoc Spotlight January session. Uh, so in this session, we'll have three talks from uh, PwC, BT and Amplify on a range of exciting uh, cyber topics. So the general sort of format of this event um, is that we'll have our first speaker who is uh, Daniel from Amplify. And we'll go through his slides and content uh, and then the same sort of and then at the end of that sort of 20 minute or so slot, um, there will be opportunity for questions. So around 10 minutes or so Q and A session um, for specifically for Daniel's uh, content. And then we'll repeat that uh, again for Stuart uh, from PwC. And uh, then finally, uh, Chris from BT as well. So you'll be able to uh, consume the content from each of our uh, speakers today and also ask them questions as we go, as we go uh, along. Okay, so just before we get started, um, the sort of upcoming events after this one. So uh, we're trying to sort of run um, on, a, on a weekly basis at the moment. So next week we'll have Georgina's um, virtual pub quiz. So we we'll be, should be giving away some prizes uh, on sort of general knowledge, uh, technology, emojis, um, sort of recently in the news kind of thing. Um, so that should be done in kind of groups, I think. Um, so of course, first, second and third should, uh, should get some prizes there. So definitely, definitely make sure to come along to that. Uh, and we and I've sort of been developing a sequel to our old OSINT CTF. So I've made another few, another sort of few 30 or so challenges based on OSINT and signals intelligence. So uh, we'll be running that the week after uh, as well. So more information on that a little bit later on. But straight away, we'll just jump straight to uh, Daniel from Amplify for, for your uh, for your talk, please. Yeah, thanks for that. Uh, and hi, everyone. It's uh, great to be here today. Hopefully you can all hear me. And the thing that I'm going to do is I'm just going to share my screen. Uh, so please uh, just give me a thumbs up if you can see the, uh, the PowerPoint uh, on the screen. Uh, so today, uh, I am going to talk to you about my work at Amplify. Uh, I uh, am really happy to be here and I hope you're all doing well. Um, I'm DJ and I lead product development at Amplify. And uh, we are creating the world's first insights automation platform. Uh, but before I uh, go into the work that I'm doing at Amplify, I'm gonna give you a bit of background about myself. So, um, so uh, I'm gonna do that, but don't worry, I will define what an insights automation platform is uh, later on in the call, because I'm sure some of you are thinking, you know, what the hell is that? Uh, so before I do that, I'll just give you a bit of uh, information about myself. So my background is actually in biochemistry and I specialized in protein folding. So trying to predict the structure of proteins. Uh, now proteins are, essentially the, the body's machines to carry out certain key functions. And so I was trying to predict their structure just using genome sequence. Now, I've been very pleased with uh, the recent developments and progress in this space, particularly uh, with DeepMind and AlphaFold. But when I was carrying out research into protein folding at university, I taught myself how to code. And the reason I taught myself how to code was I, I had a problem to solve. And this was that with the advancement of genome and protein sequencing techniques, the growth of the biological sequence databases was exponential. And so I found myself in a position where in order to gain an advantage in that field, I had to analyze and interrogate this biological sequence data at scale. And so I needed to use computational methods to do it. Uh, so I learned a number of different programming languages. I actually started out learning Perl, uh, believe it or not. Uh, but, but I learned R, I learned Python, C Sharp, and, and so on. Uh, so some of you may be wondering, well, how did I make the move from protein folding to help develop the world's first insights automation platform at Amplify? And um, I guess to answer that question, I first got to answer what is an insights automation platform. So imagine being able to take the world's knowledge, interrogate it automatically, and achieve a deep and accurate understanding 
of your research pursuit or question. Uh, and, and the platform that we are building at Amplify does this. And there are quite a lot of parallels with what I'm doing at Amplify with my work, uh, my early work in protein folding. Uh, and just to give you a few of the parallels that I see between those two worlds. The first is the, the growth of that biological sequence data and the growth of arguably the world's most comprehensive database, the internet. Uh, you know, the internet is growing uh, rapidly. There's news articles, academic papers, patents, government reports, social media content being published there every second of every day. And so we have the same uh, scenario where the, the data set is growing uh, exponentially. Uh, the, the second similarity is noise. Now, I don't know how many of you have used biological sequence data or genome data, but it is messy. Uh, and the techniques to record it often result in errors. The data storage methods used are horrific. Uh, and that brings me on to the internet. Uh, you know, the internet is a store of a huge array of disparate data stores and formats. You know, if, if, if it was a filing cabinet, you probably would be firing your secretary uh, quite, quite soon because it's not in a very good state um, at the moment. So, you, so you've got the rapid growth in data, you've got noise, um, and there's also another similarity between protein folding uh, and the internet today, and that is evolution. Uh, you know, proteins and genes evolve from common ancestors and you can track their evolutionary development over time. They mutate, and those mutations either result in advantageous or disadvantageous traits that get passed on. Well, similarly, on the internet and in the world around us, uh, we have ideas. Um, ideas exist, uh, they spread, they mutate, uh, sometimes they spread virally, of course, on the web. Uh, and so maybe just as we can track genome and protein development over time, we could start to track the uh, development of ideas uh, over time on the internet. And so these uh, similarities between what I was doing in, in uh, protein folding uh, development and the internet fascinated me. Uh, and so now I'm really pleased to be involved in creating the next generation of research at Amplify. So that's just a bit of background on me. Uh, what I would like to do now is give you a live preview of our insights automation uh, platform. So uh, I'm just going to change my slide. Oh, but, but before I do that, um, I just realized that there's a bit more that I can say before I, before I show you that. Um, another reason why I gave that backstory about me working uh, in biochemistry is because at Amplify, we are degree agnostic. We look for the most creative and technically capable people who have the self-drive to learn new techniques and whose ambition is equal to ours. And to give you an idea of just how uh, little import we give to the degree that you did, uh, in Amplify, we've got archaeologists, we've got astrophysicists, we've got neuroscientists, chemists, we've got computer scientists, of course, artists, designers, our CEO, Chris Ganji, uh, studied history. Uh, so, so, you know, for us, it's all about attitude and aptitude. And we believe through self-discovery, anything can be learned. Um, so the thing that I'm uh, uh, now going to do is I'm going to share, uh, share my browser with you and just show you some of the capabilities that we're developing at Amplify. We are working with organizations all over the world. So our customers range from uh, pharmaceutical companies to governments, to academia, uh, to the energy industry. Uh, and all of these organizations use Amplify to help make better decisions. Uh, and so I'm, I'm gonna show you uh, how we can help them do that um, now. So I'm just gonna switch my screen sharing. So if you just bear with me. Go. OK, 
Okay. Oh, and now you can see my calendar. Let me just there we go. Okay, so hopefully now you can see my home screen. Uh, this is the screen that everybody at Amplify, when they log into the system, can see. And at Amplify, we've built this insights automation platform that enables our customers to pull in content via API, uh, but they can also access our graphical user interface uh, to access all of our applications. And Amplify have built a number of different applications that are powered by our platform. Uh, the first application that I'm going to show you is called Deep Research. And Deep Research is a surface and deep web search engine. Uh, and just to show you the difference between, you know, what is the surface web, what's the deep web, I'm going to do a search on a standard search engine that you're probably all familiar with, uh, Google. So if I type in cybersecurity, let's say, into, into Google, uh, you see here I've got over 558 uh, million results in just over half a second. And you can see pretty much all of the screen is filled with adverts at the top. Uh, and I've got my results then ranked by popularity, by search engine optimization, and so on. Uh, now, the challenge that our customers face when they're using Google is these results are limited. Uh, you know, they're, they're not getting any advantage over their competition when they're using a Google uh, search platform because they're seeing exactly the same results as their competitors are. Um, one of the other disadvantages that our customers find of using these consumer search tools is if you actually try and carry out a comprehensive piece of analysis into a space, you're going to want to read more content than you can access on Google. And just to demonstrate this, I'm, I'm currently scrolling down the page and I'm clicking on the next button. Uh, and you will notice, and I'm sure many of you have done this, uh, you will notice that when you get to around page 20, you will be disappointed to find, in this case, actually, I've got 26. Um, you'll be disappointed to find that actually Google stops you um, at a certain point, and they, funnily enough, they even reduce the number of results that you can uh, access to 208, uh, 280 on the, on the search tool. So if you're carrying out, for example, customer due diligence, or you're looking for adverse media, or you're looking for emerging trends in a space, then you're going to want to access far more content than this. Uh, and so we've developed a surface and deep web search engine that uh, works a bit differently to Google in that it does not search across a pre-prepared index of documents that uh, Amplify has, but it carries out a real-time search of the web. Uh, and this is because we've developed connectors to thousands of sources around the world. Uh, and we're basically going beyond the first page of results that you can access on those sources. Uh, so you could imagine going to the gov.uk website, typing cybersecurity in, and then you can start to paginate through the 57,000 results uh, that you've got on that application. That is exactly what's going on in the background of the deep research uh, search engine. Uh, now you can also see we uh, analyze all of the content that we pull in for topics. Uh, so we extract the topics from the, the content that we're pulling in. Uh, and so our customers use this to say, okay, well, what is happening in government in this space? You can see here, I've just clicked on the government tab and it's now gonna show me all of the content uh, about cybersecurity uh, from government sources. I could say I'm interested in military or news or finance or consulting. Uh, and all of these pages then update uh, along with the topic wheel. Uh, now, the topic wheel is quite useful because actually you might say I'm interested particularly in national security in the context of cybersecurity. And you can see that I can start to drill down then into particular areas of interest to me using the topic wheel uh, and then clicking into the documents that are relevant to that particular area. So currently I'm looking at Huawei. Uh, and the links to uh, cybersecurity and national security. So this is deep research. Uh, this is all about getting as much content as we can to analyze this content. Uh, but the next application that I'm gonna show you uh, goes a step further than simply 
uh, pulling in all of this content and giving you a topic wheel, but it carries out analysis of a full text of the documents that we have harvested. So we've built a machine learning pipeline uh, on Amazon Web Services that scrapes all of the open source content that we can find on the web and extracts the full text, runs it through a number of machine learning models that we've built in-house, and then presents all of the structured information uh, that we have in an area. So for example, I could type in your artificial intelligence and you will see, instead of getting presented now with a list of search results that I've got to read myself, I can actually start to explore all of the connected entities in this space. So we've got named entity recognition, of course, uh, uh, the people, I can look at topics that have been identified. So things like autonomous cars, cloud computing, Silicon Valley, big data, deep learning. I can look at the geographic distribution of all of the content. So we're pulling in content from all over the world. So our customers use this automation platform to look into areas, uh, look from a geographic context, looking at sectors, looking at sentiment, looking at trends in a particular space. And what we're really doing here is providing an alternative to traditional methods of research uh, where they will maybe have to pay a huge amount of money to a consultancy uh, to help them uh, discover this information uh, and pass through all of this content. Uh, we're using machine learning to uh, analyze this content for them uh, on the system. Now, I'm just going to very quickly show you that you can also search for organizations and people on the platform. So, for example, I could type in a company name like Wirecard. Uh, we will analyze all of the information about that company. And I could say, okay, well, what sectors is the company involved in? Uh, you know, today, uh, most organizations classify businesses' activities based on their SIC code. Uh, there are no SIC codes that exist for cryptocurrency or blockchain or artificial intelligence. Uh, and so it's very difficult to actually identify if you're, if you're a bank, for example, what your customers do. Uh, and so what Amplify have done is we've built a machine learning model that we call the active in model. And this starts to associate organizations with the areas of activity uh, based on their descriptions in news articles or the company website. Uh, and to give you a good example of that, I can click on any topic that we have identified. So here you can see I've clicked on gambling and the machine will show me all of the documents that we've analyzed on the web that are talking about Wirecard actively be involved, being involved in gambling. So Wirecard has started out handing pay, handling payments for gambling services. Now, this is really important because, of course, customers often do not want to lend money to an organization that is associated with uh, gambling or money laundering uh, activities. So we can help our customers do that. Uh, we can also help our customers monitor sentiment of organizations over time. Uh, and critically, they can do that by sector because all of the information that we're pulling in, news articles, patents, academic content, social content, we can start to classify by the sector. And so for any organization you're interested in, you can start to see the, the sentiment associations of those uh, companies on the tool. And again, all of this is explainable on the system. So that was just a really quick view of uh, some of the capability that we're developing at Amplify uh, for our customers. Uh, the last thing I'll say just before we move into uh, some questions, uh, if I just uh, get my uh, PowerPoint back up. Uh, where are we? Uh, uh, so, so Amplify does run an internship program. Uh, and so if anybody is interested in uh, reaching out to us to, to get involved, uh, you can please get in touch and I will put, put you in touch with our chief product officer, uh, chief people officer, sorry. Uh, who will be able to give you more information on the internship program uh, that we run at Amplify. Uh, so I hope that was interesting to you and, and you learned more about the activities that we're doing um, at Amplify. And I'm very happy to answer any questions that you have. So thank you very much.
Okay, thank you, Daniel. Um, that was that was really interesting. If anyone's got any questions, just uh, chuck them in the chat, um, and we'll get those sort of answered. Uh, just give it a few minutes, just for any any thoughts to come through. Um, as I say, take your time. First thing I would sort of ask with, with this, you, you mentioned that it's sort of hosted within AWS and it's using like machine learning and things. Um, is that process of sort of running the real time kind of searches in a quite expensive computationally or is it is it kind of, a, you know, low cost and, and kind of efficient? Uh, yeah, that's a, a great question. So uh, when we started out, this was pretty expensive uh, and uh, and that was actually analyzing far less documents than we analyze today. Uh, uh, over time, uh, we have improved the efficiency of, a, of, of the models that we're running on the system. Uh, we use AWS Lambda uh, quite a lot. Uh, we've also worked in partnership with Amazon uh, to uh, use their uh, Elastic File Store system. Uh, and we were one of the first examples in the world of running machine learning models uh, using that system, uh, which means that we can start to uh, massively, uh, basically run massively parallelizable uh, documents through our system. Uh, Amplify now uh, provides access to the world's largest repository of uh, open access uh, academic and patent content uh, via our systems. And that means we've got billions of documents now in our data lake uh, being stored uh, and that's you know there's tens of millions of documents coming in every day really really interesting stuff um yeah it's like quite quite unique as well i've not really heard of um of this kind of thing it's uh, i've heard of sort of amplify before as well but i wasn't really sure um kind of what they did but this has been really sort of insightful i think um has anybody got any sort of additional questions for daniel before we move kind of move on um, we just got one. Is there any deadline for applying for your uh, sort of internship opportunities? Uh, no, absolutely not. So we're always we're always um, looking for the best talent uh, out there. Uh, so feel free to get in touch with us, and uh, yeah, we, we'll uh, we'll uh, get back get, get back to you on it. And what does the the internship consist of? So what would they sort of be doing on a, on a day to day kind of basis? Uh, yeah, so uh, when you, when you uh, carry out an internship at Amplify, we generally encourage that you get involved in a number of our activities. Uh, our engineering team rotate uh, across all of the projects that we are involved in. Uh, to give you an example of some of the projects that we have done in working with academia, uh, it, it was about last year, I think we were working with uh, Harvard University to uh, assess uh, North Korea's bioweapons capability using this platform. Uh, and then uh, we're, we're currently doing work with a, uh, a university in the United States uh, uh, looking into uh, China's uh, economy. Uh, so if you, uh, you know, carry out an internship with us, uh, you would probably carry out a number of tasks ranging from machine learning to uh, engineering, uh, and even you will have the opportunity to get involved in the business uh, side of uh, what we do at Amplify. Cool. Uh, what kind of sort of skill level would you expect um, sort of incoming interns or, or graduates, you know, to have? Uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, our philosophy is that we uh, don't uh, we don't see the degree that you carry out. Uh, to be as important as attitude. Uh, and so, uh, you, you know, a lot of the stuff that we do, uh, we have world leading experts in spaces working at Amplify, so they can train you uh, in certain areas. Uh, but we would expect, uh, you know, bachelor's degree uh, level at a minimum. I think the last one we've got here is, uh, are you offering kind of a, a mix of summer internships or year, years in industry or are they kind of graduate roles? Uh, it's a mix, uh, but I recommend uh, if you are more, in, if, if you want more information, uh, just to get in touch uh, with us and uh, we'll be able to send out kind of documentation on this uh, from our chief people officer. Great, and in terms of contacting you, do you have an email address which is... 
Oh, the best. Uh, I recommend if you just go to amplify.com, uh, you'll see the FESA contact form uh, there. So you'll be able to fill that out. Uh, we do also have a careers page that you can look at. Uh, but even if you don't see, you know, relevant opportunities on the careers page at Amplify, just send a, a message via the, the contact form uh, and uh, somebody will get in touch with you. I think that's great. Yeah, that's brilliant. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, if there's no more questions for, uh, for Daniel here, then uh, we can move straight on to Stuart, uh, who's a cyber director at PwC, uh, if, he's, if he's there. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you, Dan. Cheers, Jack. Thanks, Dan. Can you hear me? Yeah. Marvellous. I like it. Right, let me try to share my screen then. Pick the right one. With a bit of luck, you should be seeing my screen now. Is that right? Yeah, we can see it. Marvellous. Cool. Uh, so, uh, good evening, I guess it is now, uh, everybody. Um, thanks for um, inviting me along to say hello. Uh, my name is Stuart Criddle. I'm the director for the Ethical Hack team in uh, PwC in the UK. Uh, I'm a, a Crest fellow. I sit on the uh, the exec board and the assessors panel, so I help to develop a lot of the exams that uh, exist in this space as well. Um, the team that I sit in is Cyber Threat Operations. Obviously, I could talk about cyber and hacking and toys and things for hours and hours and hours, but I thought as a uh, the type of audience I'm guessing in, in the student world are be interested in jobs and roles and what we do and the types of roles that are available. So um, I'll give you a fairly whistle-stop tour of um, the types of work that we do within our team. Uh, so yeah, just a little about me. Uh, I'm from Cardiff. Um, my background is electronics. I'm married with two sons. Um, I like the outdoors, mountains, skiing, beaches, uh, getting muddy in jeeps, as you can probably tell from the picture. Uh, my general dislikes COVID lockdown and being stuck in uh, at uh, at the house for, for weeks and weeks and weeks on end. I used to moan about commuting into the office. I'll never moan about that again. Um, it's all good. So. Uh, I'm also the, uh, the the lead for the ethical hacking recruitment um, side of things. Um, we're building quite a big team in Cardiff. There's about 40 of us, I think, now in the Cardiff office. Um, backing on some of the stuff that Dan said, actually, we're also passionate about diversity and equality. It's not really for us about the type of degree that you've got specifically, although we do prefer STEM subjects. That said, we've got people on our grad course this year with history degrees and uh, um, English degrees and things that are, that are not even within the STEM um, sort of subject area. The main thing we're interested in is other people are passionate about their subject, what they're interested in, in working on um, and learning, because we can't make somebody interested, but uh, uh, we can help train you with the skills if you need them. So, so the cyber threat operations team, um, CTO within PwC, uh, we're a national team that covers um, generally both defensive uh, and offensive cyber. Uh, you can see the locations on the screen there that we cover. Uh, most of our team are um, Cardiff, London based. There are some in Bristol, a few in Manchester. An ever-expanding group up in Edinburgh now. The uh, the Scots are taking over the world slowly, um, and uh, there's a, a, a good few in Belfast as well. So we are those where our main offices are, and we are becoming obviously due to COVID a little bit less um, office centric these days. Um, so the, the the key players on the screen there. So Chris McConkey is the partner that runs the whole of CTO. So he oversees things. He's from a um, sort of predominantly a threat intelligence and incident response background. Uh, and then Colin that runs the uh, managed cyber stuff um, and Ollie and David that each, like I do then lead one of the streams. So outside of CTO, uh, the five sort of pillars that cyber uh, encompasses. So I used to think many years ago that cyber was all about hands on keyboards and, and nerdy techie things. I had to learn my the, the better of my ways there and realize that actually it covers so much of a, uh, a broad set of propositions. So these are the sorts of things that um, PwC covers within, just, just within our cyber team um, rather than anything outside of it. So the whole sort of risk advisory part of things uh, on the, the left hand side there, um, looking at the sort of the higher level governance type reviews quite frequently. Um, supply chain assurance is a really interesting one and security assurance. Um, security within deals. So obviously as a, a company with a background in the, the financial services industry, we do a lot of work in the deal space one of the things there is if you're buying another company, is the company that you're buying um, already infected? Is it, is it secure? 
Um, do they have cyber problems? What does that look like? Equally, divestment and separation is a really interesting piece. If you're going to sell off part of your company, how do you make sure that the part you've sold off um, is then properly segregated away from the network that you're in? Cyber technology and transformation. So a lot of the problems that we see within our, or my specific team, the ethical hacking team, um, come back actually to requiring quite strategic changes to technology in some places. Um, so things like the identity and access management team. So that will be looking at um, how people authenticate what their um, sort of uh, databases of users look like, what sort of security mechanisms are being used um, to try out, are they using multi-factor multi auth, for example, these, these kind of things. You can take away a lot of cyber risk by doing some of the basics well. And that's what our technology and transformation team does. Cyber incidents and culture. Uh, we'll come on to some of this a little more uh, detail later. The, the crisis and culture team that we work with um, quite closely because of the, the overlap with our red teaming work um, play a key role in trying to help our clients understand what their response would be, not in a technical sense, but you've all seen um, individuals have ended up on the television with a microphone being thrust into their face after by a an interviewer after a, a, a big cyber breach or a big hack has hit the news, trying to get ahead of sort of some of those situations and make sure that clients have thought through in advance what their media strategy will be, what their responses will be. Um, without sort of showing my age, I guess, as a Ghostbusters reference in there somewhere, it, it is down to who are you going to call? Um, do, you, do you call your boss if there's an incident? Do you call an outside third party? Have you thought through a lot of the, um, the sort of the strategic side of incident management in advance? And then cyber defense and detection on the right hand side there, the more technical teams, well, that's the team that I sit in where we are predominantly hands on keyboards in terms of um, actually fighting with technology and trying to work out um, how the bad guys might get in or um, if they have already. So cyber threat operations, the, the whistle stop tool. Um, these are the, the six key elements to the team that I work in. So ethical hacking is the part that I lead. I'll, come, I'll go through all of these in a little bit more detail uh, as we run through, although I have got a lot of slides um, for 20 minutes, so I'll be, I'll be fairly brief. I'm hoping that uh, you, can look, you can look at them in, on YouTube in more detail later if any of them take your fancy particularly, or feel free to drop an email with any questions. Uh, my email's on the front of the last page of the slides. So the, the offensive stuff, the ethical hacking side of things that sits under the, the team uh, that, that I run, um, incident response. So this is the practical stuff on site, um, back to the Ghostbusters joke. Sometimes we do get calls, in fact, frequently we do get calls to send teams with grab bags in the middle of the night to go and do investigations and try and find out what's happening. Um, threat intelligence, this is the team that looks uh, at who's doing what and why. I, I was quite interested in, in Dan's presentation earlier on. There's a, an overlap uh, in some of the things that our TI team would do around some of the deep web stuff with some of the things that, uh, that Amplify is doing. So I might just be Googling and Amplify myself later. Um, manage cyber defense. So this is a, a real-time 24-7 team that actually looks after clients' networks, trying to um, help automate responses and uh, make sure that where automation is, is, is not appropriate, there are human beings with keyboards to identify what's going on. I'll take you to a couple of uh, interesting um, recent stories from that from those guys later on. Um, threat hunting again, uh, and I say this is quite interesting to the sort of the deals um, side of things. Quite frequently, that, asking that question: Am I secure? Have I ever been compromised? Are there bad actors on my network already? Um, so, looking through uh, traffic logs, uh, network and endpoint stuff to see what we can find. And then the threat advisory team is sort of a, is a bit of a cross cutting team that sits across um, CTO. Uh, often actually sharing staff. So one of the, the nice things about having such a big team, there's about um, the hand around about 150 staff, I think, offhand in the, the whole of this division, um, is that we borrow staff from other teams. So I've got a couple of my team uh, at the moment actually out with the threat advisory guys working on client stuff there, um, it, trying to proactively bring down the risk in client, net, in client networks and do it quickly. So what do we do within the ethical hacking arena? Red teaming, purple teaming, penetration testing, again, the, quite a lot of overlap there in the traditional sense. Um, red teaming being generally goal driven. So we'll go after a network and um, I'll pick an example from a very long time ago, a client once said to me, 
we, we make semiconductors. If you can find the plans for the semiconductors, we're really interested in, in, in how that would affect our business because they are our crown jewels. So that's a, a good example of sort of target driven pen testing where we were told to go after something in the finance uh, sector or in, in manufacturing, in, in big corporates that might be, can you get access to payment systems? Um, a lot of the things we see driving uh, real world attacks are, are sadly financial um, basis, whether that's extorting money or stealing money directly. Um, purple teaming is a sort of an overlap of the two where we put some of our defense teams together with um, our offensive teams to try and help simulate what would happen um, if somebody was breaking into a network and allow then the defensive teams to get a good feel for what they should be looking for, what a real world attack might look like. Industrial systems, um, there's been quite a few well-known attacks um, over the years looking at um, there's a big uh, metal manufacturer, I think it was last year, got uh, some, some serious problems all over the news. Industrial systems are these days pretty much all controlled by computer. Back in the day, it was far more offline, but there's those two platforms that sort of melded together. The internet has become a very viable method for taking down uh, manufacturing plants, particularly, um, which can be um, obviously a, a serious risk to uh, financial income for a client, but it can also be a, a, a big safety risk, um, depending on the sort of plant the systems are controlling. Hardware and IoT lap, overlap straight into that space as well, generally with a um, less dangerous outcome, as usually, thankfully, but. Uh, um, quite a lot of privacy concerns over the way that IoT is flooding the market, particularly in, in, in homes these days. You've all seen the stuff in the news about uh, cameras in kids' bedrooms uh, causing problems and uh, being hackable on the internet, often due to poor configurations, but also often due to um, poor technology in them. Uh, and then finally, automotive, I'll, I'll mention that in a, in a little bit. Um, our cars that we're driving are becoming far more, more connected, pretty much every modern vehicle these days. Is advertised as having a radio and sat nav. What it actually has is an Android box or Linux box running in the dashboard um, that happens to also provide those services. There's a lot on this slide. As I said, I've got, I'm on a time a time issue, so I won't run through all of it. Um, I guess the interesting bits there probably not mentioned static analysis um, on code review, actually looking at the source code for clients. If you've got big, old, complicated applications, a really good way of looking at. Uh, or looking for vulnerabilities in them is to go through them um, with the source code at hand, um, trying to get as much coverage as possible. It's one of the difficult parts of pen testing is you can never say what you cut, you, you can say what you have found. You can never prove that something is secure and there is nothing in there to find. So, so I think these, within the pen testing bit, probably the bits that people are most familiar with are web application pen testing. So I think uh, Jack has run quite a lot of capture the flag type things um, from what I've, discussions I've had with him. Uh, if you look on Try Hack Me and sites like that, there's quite a lot of um, training materials out there around these for the port trigger stuff as well. It, it's a key part of what we deliver um, as, a, as, as, a, as a firm. Internal infrastructure testing, we do a lot of that for government, a lot of that for banking, particularly where they're looking at the, the insides of their networks. Um, also, a lot, a lot of CNI um, manufacturers and sort of uh, oil, gas, water, the sort of the, the big heavy industry type players are really interested in how secure their networks are on the inside as well as the outside. Um, can you get from one part to another particularly? Um, very interesting when you've got very large networks, particularly when they're multinational. External infrastructure, so from the internet, what's exposed, there's been quite a lot of interesting bugs in the last, well, during COVID really, around various endpoint technologies that have allowed people straight into networks. It is very difficult to keep things secure. The, the ongoing joke is that if you're doing pen testing or attacking, you've only got to get lucky once. But if you're doing the, the blue team and the defensive side, you've got to be lucky all the time. So it's a tricky thing. Uh, one of my personal pet interests is uh, security of vehicles. This is a, a brief overview of um, the, the potential attack vectors for cars. So there's a lot of them. So OBD2 there, the traditional sort of uh, diagnostics port that's under the driver's foot well for most cars. We should be aware of a lot of attacks against keyless entry systems that uh, uh, have involved a lot of cars being stolen in recent years. But cars are more and more connected, cloud services, um, G, uh, 4G connections, Wi-Fi tethering. So um, a lot of cars these days will offer to tether to your phone to get onto the internet to do updates um, for maps, for example, for um, navigation systems. So 
um, what, what attacks can be performed there. Uh, but also obviously we're heading now much more towards electric vehicles and vehicle to uh, vehicle and vehicle to infrastructure communication. So the the good old fashioned car that I grew up with uh, is no longer a thing, unfortunately. It's uh, everything is very much these days um, connected. So in terms of uh, war stories, because everyone loves those recent examples, we've got a couple of big red teams running uh, right now um, over a, a number of multinational banking clients. Um, it is very difficult to break into a bank, but I can't say too much, but I will say it's not impossible. Um, and banks do spend a lot of money making sure that they have the best in the industry testing their systems to try and make sure that they can't get compromised by uh, malicious actors who are out there to do damage or steal money. Um, it's, it, there is some really interesting work going on in that space. It really is a cat and mouse game. Um, retail red teams, we did a big attack against a, a large UK retailer recently, managed to get full control from the internet of all of the tills across all of their stores across the UK. So that would have allowed us to do two really interesting things. One of them is shut the tills down and basically shut down the shops and the revenue streams for them and, and probably caused quite a lot of, uh, of customer angst at the same time. The other thing we could have done is to install uh, logging software and steal credit card numbers and data off those tills. Um, it is uh, a difficult uh, and, and uh, costly exercise to review all the security in a, in a large retail environment when you consider everything from lorries and manufacturing and deliveries right the way through to payment gateways, but uh, it's, a, it's a big focus uh, for a lot of our customers. Uh, manufacturing web app we did a few weeks ago um, using some technology you don't see very often and it was just very badly written, which is good to show that human error gets in everywhere still. Um, if you asked it nicely, it would give you, as an unauthenticated user, um, the password for whichever hash, whichever user you asked it for, which you could then go and crack offline, so that was quite good fun. Um, and hardware devices, so there's a big lab in our Cardiff office that allows us to physically remove chips from circuit boards, dump them into chip readers, pull off the firmware, the data, um, and see what they're doing. All right, so I'll jump on now to the, uh, the incident response team. People think about incident response as being what do you do when the phone rings, but actually far more important parts are the preparation that you do before the phone rings. Um, and then the, the wash up stuff that you do afterwards. So things on here like root cause analysis, for example, it's all it's all very all great fun making sure you've got rid of the people off your network and that you're um, you're now nice and secure. But if they come back in tomorrow and repeat the process, that's a real problem. Um, if you don't know what to do when an incident occurs, that's also um, a, a real problem. So uh, on the readiness side of things, the, I guess some of the key bits that we do there are forensic readiness. It sounds really tedious, but actually just making sure that logs are being recorded and are available. Um, you'd be amazed how many IT uh, networks over the years have just had logs set to last seven days or um, or not even collated at all, uh, just being sat on local machines with incorrect timestamps and things that make it difficult to bring it together. We offer our customers retainers, um, so they've got someone to phone if they need it. Uh, we have, let's say, teams sort of sat there ready to do that. Um, as part of the retainers, we actually do a lot of this preparation work with our clients to make sure that um, we run workshops with their, with their teams in advance to try and prep them as best that we can. Um, and then post-incident services, so digital forensics and reverse engineering. So we've got a team of um, malware reverse engineers who spend um, literally all their working days uh, taking apart the things that we find on, on client networks and that we, we get given by other partners to analyze. It's a really rich source for us for um, TTPs that allow us to then go threat hunting across the network with our, with our other clients. And obviously we sit on various networks as well where we then um, will share critical TTPs with uh, other interested third parties in, um, in, including um, non-commercial agencies like government partners, for example. And then post-incident again, as I said before, trying to make sure that um things don't happen twice because that, that's that's no fun and if there are lessons to be learned about how we make things better faster easier cheaper because incident response um, can be quite an expensive service um, that we can get get all those improvements in place. think about ransomware there as an example um if you are struggling um with, with a ransomware attack and you, you don't wish to pay for the keys and that's a, a really difficult discussion to have um you need to make sure that you've got really strong backups in place. Um, that is a lesson that uh, can be quite hard learned for, for some people. 
Uh, threat intelligence, this is the stuff that I mentioned at the start that kind of overlaps possibly with some of the things that Dan does a little bit, um, albeit I think he has a bigger engine than we do. Um, we use a lot of bespoke tools internally uh, developed. I think our, our targeting is quite specific. Uh, we're not trying to index the internet like uh, Amplify are with going after very specific sources that link to the types of actors that we're trying to chase around networks. So one of the things that we are um, very good at and, and, and globally renowned for is our ability to track what global actors are doing, who they actually are. Um, if you look on our website, there are a number of reports we've actually gone public with. Clearly there are a lot more reports that we've released to clients that are not public, um, that actually will go down to the levels of, of, of displaying um, types of, uh, for example, phishing attacks that we're seeing that are being used in one particular corner of the world. And you look at them and you wonder, what, why is that relevant? And then actually we engage with uh, um, some of our sort of our, our, our global um, teams that are sort of, sorry, um, those that have got the, the global insights within those teams who can then actually say, well, actually the reason that email means something there is those two countries are arguing about water, for example, at the moment. So where water is flowing down um, between countries, it can often be a a source of contention and certain types of phishing attacks that we would look at and think that makes no sense in the West. And you suddenly put it into the context of the sort of the, the global politics and macroeconomics behind things. Um, and that then um, can give our clients a really a really rich insight into the types of attacks they might see that they need to look out for. So we use a, a mix of commercial sources where we um, we pay for access to a number of monitoring platforms, a number of data sources in terms of um, internet traffic, zone files, um, what DNS records are being registered. Um, we are lucky enough to be part of a, a very large um, global firm. We've got over a quarter of a million staff. Um, we have a lot of sensors on all of our workstations so we can pick up stuff that's being pulled in from all around the world as part of that. Um, and then again, partly because of our size, we're very lucky to have a large number of um, foreign language speakers, Chinese, Russian, Korean, Arabic, um, within our geopolitical teams, they're, they're really helpful to us. So manage cyber defense. This is the 24 seven service that we run actually looking after people's endpoints for them. Um, extended cloud security orchestration, automation and response is a bit of a mouthful, shortened to SOAR. Basically that's uh, trying to become as much of an all seeing eye to endpoint for technology particularly as possible. Um, so there, prepare for the worst, integrate what you've got and automate the rest. We use lots of automation to try and shut things down quickly and send alerts quickly. Uh, but then we have um, experienced operators running in two teams, one in the UK covering 12 hours this side of the world, another then in New Zealand offering the uh, other side, other 12 hours. So we do have genuine 24 seven coverage for our clients. Um, it's all about time. Um, everyone needs to be faster these days. Um, and I'm running out of time, so I'll be quick. The key thing here is, is number two, really reduce the time between detection and response to seconds or minutes. Um, that can make a real difference. If, we, if we're running a red team and somebody finds us in five minutes rather than five hours, the odds are we will be able to get much less far into a network. Um, if you want to Google something later, uh, here's a link to the insights section on our website, how we stop the novel cyber attack in seven minutes. This was a, a, a well-known, um, threat acts that have been going after one of our clients for a long while. Um, they eventually managed to get a very, very small level of access um, to uh, one of the, uh, the, the user's workstations. Uh, within seven minutes, we had found it, extracted it, found the TTP, shut it down, and the client isolated the workstation, um, and there was no further access from that point. So it is all for us in this service about trying to reduce that window from seven weeks, seven days, seven hours, seven minutes in this case. I'm going to jump on because I'm running out of time. So uh, threat hunting, um, a similar kind of technology using the, the, the TTPs that we generate from our threat intel teams again, and all the stuff that we get from our incident response teams. Um, but this time looking for um, historic or active compromise rather than um, using specific installing ongoing technologies necessarily for our sort of managed cyber services. But this is trying to answer the question as to what is potentially there on a network here and now. I'll jump over these. Threat advisory, um, I mentioned this previously, 
this is this is our attempt at trying to help customers to do things fairly quickly. Quite often, customers will receive pen test reports. They'll sit on their desks for a long time. You might go back and run another t another pen test a year later on an internal network, for example, and find all the same problems. That's not helpful. Um, the problems are often quite hard. Um, IT teams are quite busy, so this is a service where we work with uh, both internal SOC and SIEM teams on the blue side, IT teams, and then bring in project management and technical um, resource from CTO to explain what the fault problems are, try and get these three packages of work sorted, rapid find and fix of things that we can fix quickly and easily, we get those in and get them done, tactical work packages that are not going to take too long but can make a big difference, um, sometimes that can be bringing in, in new technology, often it's using existing technology better, um, and then the strategic initiative stuff, so we're trying to learn some of the um, the longer and harder lessons. I guess many of you will be familiar with the uh, the micro attack framework. So this is something that our find and fix guys um, do use to try and make it life harder for us as a red team. Uh, and one of the things that we're really, we're really interested in through this series is to make sure that we break as many of those steps in the chain and as many of the types of steps available for each element of the chain um, to make life harder, basically, so that uh, it's, it's much more difficult for either a red team or a bad actor to um, get through a network. Not bad, three minutes later. Um, I had one, I had a sneaky question, because um, there's always the same question I get asked while you guys ask, think of questions to ask me. Uh, what makes a candidate stand out on a CV is what I'm always asked every time I do one of these sessions. Um, enthusiasm is the first one. Um, activities beyond those taught on your course. Um, it's quite depressing to do interviewing where the answer to every question is, on my course, they said. Um, we're really interested to know what you're um, interested in beyond your course, what self-learning have you done, what um, outside activities like this one, for example, that you've taken part in. And also, if you've got niche skills you've learned along the way, like reverse engineering, that is also something that will um, help make you stand out um, on a CV or in an interview. Um, or in fact, uh, one of our recruits got a job by tweeting Chris McConkey um, and asking him some interesting questions. So um, many roads are open. Any questions? Yeah, any questions for Stuart? Uh, drop them in the chat. Uh, thank you, Stuart. That was really interesting. Um, just a sort of one to sort of get it going. Um, if, if any students were thinking or, or looking at ethical hacking as a potential kind of career, um, what kind of, I guess, reflexive questions should they be asking themselves, you know, as to, to help them work out whether it's going to be the right kind of decision for them? That's a deep question for a Friday night. Um, <laughs> I apologize. The, the, no, it's fine. There's a, there's a great answer to it. Um, I, I would say that careers in cyber particularly, but especially careers in, in ethical hacking, um, are better described as a lifestyle choice than a career. Um, if you think you're gonna work nine till five and then go home and it's all, it's all gravy, it's probably a mistake. The world is changing so fast that if you're not deeply, deeply interested in the topic, um, it may be a difficult thing to, but you might wanna consider a different choice. Um, it, it's a little, I guess, a bit like being uh, at the forefront of a, a medical career. You have to stay on top of things that are changing all of the time. Not that I ever wish to equate what we do with doctors, of course, um, but the rate of pace of change um, is, is probably similar. There is always something new. You can wake up one morning and there'd be a massive attack overnight that's brought out a new vulnerability. Um, if you're not on top of that, then you're behind the curve where your clients need you to be. Um, so it is. It, it is a difficult thing to stay on top of, but if, you, if you're interested in it, and it's something like, for me, I find it fascinating, I just really enjoy it. Um, my wife will tell you that I often sit there looking at signal messages from colleagues late at night where interesting things have come out, particularly from the US due to the time zones. Um, it, it is, it is a, it's, a, it's a fascinating space to work in, but it is certainly, in the 20 years I've been doing it, I wouldn't describe it as a straight nine to five career choice. Okay, thank you. Um... Uh, and sort of just just to sort of distinguish between sort of the area of pen testing, the area of red teaming, uh, how would you sort of describe the distinction? Just to sort of clarify those. Sure. So uh, red, as I said before, red teaming is, is very much a goal based activity, whereas pen testing tends to be a more methodical. Can you find, I wouldn't like to say all, but most of the vulnerabilities within an area. So um, if you look back at um, this sort of micro attack framework type page, for example, um, there is a, a, a jagged line through there. If, if I'm doing a red team, I probably only care about, if you follow that line, 
I sent a spear phishing email, I dropped command line access, I created an account, I got footage as escalation, turned off the antivirus, found some credits in, in tools, went to it, and then nicked off with all the data I wanted to exfiltrate. So obviously from a pen test point of view, if I was looking at a workstation um, for that initial access, I would probably want to make sure that it was secure against as many of those in one list as possible. So because red teaming is very much goal-based and it is, can you get from end to end, um, yes or no, and, and, and find what you're looking for. Um, it, is, it, is le it is less about trying to find lots of vulnerabilities. It's more about trying to find enough vulnerabilities. Um, and it also tends to be much more open-ended because you're actually being given um, a, a goal or a task rather than a, a machine or a constrained set of machines to do some work on. Okay, thank you. And um, just a couple of, of like recruitment uh, related questions here. The first one is uh, regarding visa sponsorship. Is that still something you do? Uh, and then the second one, uh, what would the sort of timescales be with regards to like, you know, deadlines for a year in industry? Um, we do sponsor visas. Um, it's not something we do a lot of, if I'm honest. Generally, you would need to be um, a fairly unusual candidate, it's probably a good way of putting it, um, for um, one of the CTO roles for us to go down the, 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 the visa sponsorship route. But I say it, it, it is something we do. We've got a, um, a student that started with us this year who is on a, um, a, an excellent visa that we're sponsoring. So it, it is an option. Um, in terms of years in industry and all, all of those schemes are um, run through um, our main, so we have a very, we, we take on uh, a very, very large number of students every year of which Penn Testing takes a very small number of them. We still use this pretty much most of the same recruitment processes. So um, if you're looking for those roles, they will be advertised on the main PwC student recruitment website and there is a, a, an application process on there for them. Uh, what I would say is our student recruitment process is quite rigid and, and well defined. Um, there are lots of YouTube videos and articles and things, even some that we've that we've put out there ourselves um, on how our process works and the types of questions you'll get asked, um, the types of things you need to do um, in terms of, sort of on, online or automated evaluations and things. Prep yourself as, as best as you can beforehand because you only get one shot. I think I think offhand, please don't quote me. You can only apply once in six months um, through that process. So um, you need to make sure that you've done all the prep you can beforehand so you don't get caught out by uh, any of the steps. So um, yes, it's all online. Preparation is key. If you have got questions, feel free to drop me an email and I can link you in to the student recruitment teams um, that will have all the details. Okay, great. Uh, so I guess the last one then, um, again, a little bit of a deep one. Uh, what, what would you say is the most sort of memorable or I guess, interesting kind of moment in your cyber career. So is it like an incident that you've dealt with some kind of project that you've been on? I, there's a lot of them I can't talk about. Yeah. A lot of them are cleared, so I'll ignore that bit. Um, in terms of ones I can talk about, um, I once walked into um, a very, very, very large supermarket via the, um, the rear entrance. And I asked, the, uh, the lady on the desk for the keys to the server room uh, as part of the social engineering job, and that was all fine. Um, and she said, I'm really sorry, the, uh, the head of security is in the server room um, doing an audit, and it's like, okay, I mean, I'm the wrong guy in the wrong place at the wrong time. Um, that was, I, I, thought, I thought I had it at that point. She said, don't worry, love, it's fine. Um, she said, go upstairs, tell Brenda in the canteen to give you a coffee and a donut, and when he's gone, I'll ring Brenda, you can come down, I'll give you the keys. And I thought, my cover is clearly blown here and I'm about to go and get arrested. Um, something really bad is going to occur. But no, what actually happened was I spent half an hour reading the newspaper in the canteen, had a lovely donut and a cup of coffee, and then they gave me the keys for the server room and the job went without a hitch. It was great. So, um, But I was shaking so badly I struggled to sign my name in the book going in because um, I was convinced I was convinced it was a stitch up. But uh, it, was, it turns out that when you're doing social engineering gigs, generally people are just really nice to you. They just want to be helpful. Um, yeah, that 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 was that was some actually a previous employer maybe a decade ago now, but it, it really stuck stuck in my mind as one of those situations where you had to keep going to find out whether it was true or not. But even if you were absolutely convinced that was that you were blown already, but no, it was fine. Interesting. Yeah, um, there's all sorts of interesting things that go on, isn't there? So yeah. Yeah. very much so. Yeah, uh, well, that was uh, that was a really interesting talk. Yeah, thank you, thank you for that, Stuart, um, uh, and answering our questions there.
Cool. So uh, yeah, make, make a note of Stuart's email. Uh, he, he's always happy to sort of answer some uh, some questions if you come up with any after the after the session. But we'll jump straight to uh, to Chris Brake, uh, who works, is working within the security team at uh, BT. Hello. Hopefully you can see my screen. Yeah, we can see it. Awesome. Cool. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for having me today. So uh, my name is Chris Brake. So I. I work for BT Security, um, and I imagine a lot of you probably think, um, you know, when you think of BT, you think of just broadband uh, or maybe BT Sport, but we actually have like a, a massive uh, security team because we're having to protect ourselves uh, from all sorts of cyber attacks as we kind of support that um, internet backbone in the UK. Uh, and then we sort of provide managed security services across the globe as we operate in 180 different countries. Um, so it's something I didn't realize when, until I joined BT of the sort of, um, we have our fingers in, in lots of different pies. Um, and my role particularly, I sit within the security advisory team um, with a focus on cyber threat management. So we try to work with customers to help them understand the things that they should be worried about within a, in a cyber space. Because as, as Stuart alluded to, there's lots of different areas and it's very complicated. Um, and security can be expensive if you get it wrong. Uh, so we, we aim to try and help them uh, build those defenses as, as high as they can to try and deter the bad guys, um, which is interesting because there's a whole range of different customers of, of different maturities. Um, so it, it keeps you on your toes. Uh, so I was going to give a, a talk around uh, various different areas, sort of a, a main focus on this idea of threat detection engineering, which is something that uh, I've been quite involved with over the last few years. Um, I'll touch briefly on, on MITRE ATT&CK um, I think Stuart covered, covered the most of it, but essentially for those who, that aren't familiar with it, it, it does stand for Adversarial Tactics, Techniques and Common Knowledge, uh, and it's essentially just a knowledge base uh, that MITRE have been curating over the years by looking at real world observations and essentially categorizing what those, those different threat actors are doing. Uh, so we can then have those discussions with customers and, and, other, and other security teams to say, um, this is what has happened in this event and use a similar language and, and parlance so everybody's on the same page because um, I've had past discussions where you know you, you say the word malware in a room and it means about 12 different things depending on who you're talking to so MITRE attacks kind of been an integral for how we have those conversations with customers to make sure that um, we're clearly clearly defining what we're talking about and uh, everybody knows what we're, what we're doing. Um, a really cool resource uh, that you can go and have a play with online is, is MITRE's Attack Navigator. Um, so similar to what Stuart was showing with those attack vectors, you can sort of make your own and has some filters and some cool features to allow you to sort of um, model different common malwares uh, and the, the techniques that uh, known threat actors are known to use. So that's a pretty pretty cool way of um, visualizing stuff that we've, we've used to kind of articulate to customers. Uh, this is the things you should be worried about, or these where you have gaps in your security capabilities, for example. Uh, so uh, the idea of threat detection engineering has kind of come from MITRE itself. So a few years ago, they published a paper called uh, Finding Cyber Threats with Attack-Based Analytics. And essentially, they went into detail about how they uh, use MITRE attack themselves to develop analytics to detect and observe what the adversaries are doing. Uh, in their paper, they broke it down into sort of seven stages, which was uh, identifying behaviors, uh, acquiring data, developing analytics, developing an adversary emulation scenario, emulating that threat, investigating it, and then finally evaluating the performance. So we sort of squashed that into sort of uh, four categories, as you can see in the diagram on the right. And we use this to kind of um, help customers understand this is where you need to, this is the sort of process that we'll do to help you get that security capability risen. So identifying behaviors and understanding the threats that threat intelligence is telling us, using that to then develop analytics and then helping them deploy that to their various security tools so they can start to increase their security defenses and make it harder for the adversary to sort of move around in their network or, or attack them to begin with. Uh, so those sort of first two stages around um, understanding the behaviors and uh, identifying the, the sort of indicators of compromise kind of comes from sort of threat intelligence. And as, as sort of Stuart alluded to, it, it provides that context. So um, yeah, there's no point in a retail company that's using Windows systems to have a look at all the threat intelligence around Linux, for example, because it won't apply to them. So it's making sure that we can, as BT, we've got uh, quite a large threat intelligence team that takes feeds from um, 
open source and, and sort of internal private channels to kind of give that view to customers and say, you know, these are the things that we think you should be worried about based on what your organization looks like. So that can take into factors such as the, the geography that they sit in as, as well as their sort of organizational footprint within terms of, you know, you operate in these environments. This is the, the kind of things that we've seen in the past that threat intelligence is, is alluding to. Um, when we go to understanding the, the behaviors that are exhibited in those threat intelligence reports, uh, we can take this as an example. Um, so this snippet has got various bits of key information that we can start to pull out and tag to Mitre attack to kind of give that understanding to a customer of, you know, this is the kind of stuff that you should be worried about. Um, so as you can see on screen, there's various bits of snippets as you read, you can kind of say, okay, um, this is executing a, a, an exploit against a known vulnerability, which gave somebody system access. The piece of malware would then run this command just to double check that the vulnerability was successful and it did have system access. And then its job was to schedule tasks and then reach back out through a proxy. So all of this kind of behavior, we can then start to analyze and understand and go, well, how can we detect that? And if we start to layer up multiple uh, pieces of threat intelligence and start to see there's a common theme between all of these different threat actors that they use scheduled tasks as an example, we can say, well, let's focus on developing rules and detections and, and mitigations to stop there to kind of get the biggest bang for your buck from a security perspective. Uh, so we wanted to try and think about how do we provide that kind of service to customers at a large scale, because uh, typically uh, organizations will have maybe one or two security tools. They have rules in, um, but we as a managed security, managed security provider uh, kind of offer these services to multiple customers across multiple technologies. So you can imagine as you know, you wake up and the latest attacks happened, we need to quickly roll out rules um, to make sure that customer is protected. Um, we then have to write it in sort of six different technology uh, syntaxes um, and try and copy that logic and make sure it's uh, accurate across all of them. It can be quite quite a difficult challenge. So that's where we came across um, an open source project called Sigma. So Sigma aims to create uh, seam rules in a generic format that can then be converted using its underlying Python engine into different um, technology backends, such as Splunk, QRadar, um, ArcSight. Uh, I think you've got things like PowerShell as well. So that allows us to kind of develop the detection logic at a high level and then convert it into something that can be used um, by that end technology. And then the content development specialists, so the people that have that really deep understanding of, of how that technology work, can take that um, rule, which might be 80, 90% of the way there, and apply those sort of uh, custom filters and um, tuning to make sure they work for a particular customer environment or, or technology, because it is very difficult trying to do that conversion the other way around. Um, definitely if you try and take something from QRadar, for example, which um, is IBM's uh, SIEM technology, it has lots of building blocks and uh, QIDs, which are very specific to it. Um, that you know Splunk just wouldn't understand. So it's a, a way of kind of breaking down those barriers and meaning that we can uh, develop de te detections at a, a fast pace and get them out to different customers and environments uh, and share them with, with other people as, as we need to. Uh, so an example of what a Sigma rule looks like is on the screen. So uh, this is a pretty old rule that's looking for um, you know, adversaries might try to understand what security tools are on a device so they can try and then go disable them. And uh, so there's some common commands that they might run. So if we're collecting that kind of information, we can start to sift through it and understand if we see this, that's a bit suspicious. So maybe we should develop a, a detection to look for it. Um, then we could write this in, in a Sigma format. I could then run the SIGMAC, which is uh, Sigma's Python engine against it. And then I could have it into multiple different backends, uh, which is a cool, cool, nice approach to doing it. But I don't want to have to be running Python scripts all the time to convert rules and giving it to customers. So we thought, how can we take that to the next level uh, and automate it? So uh, within BT, we've developed a platform that can take those Sigma rules and have them in a, in a central repository of, of all the detections that we've created. Uh, and whenever there is a new rule updated, uh, it pushes that to our build automation server. So it effectively takes that code that's written in a Sigma format, and it then applies that Sigma logic to it and is then able to build it for all the different backends that we need to support uh, across our security managed services, meaning that we can develop detections to protect not just ourselves, but our customers at the same time and make sure they're deployed everywhere to make sure that that value and detection capability 
is, is being applied so we can say you know when the customer picks up the phone having seen the latest news headline going am i protected and go yeah we've already developed something for you uh, and we're applying it to your estate at the, as as we speak and um, so what that sort of kind of output looks like is, is in is this different format so that signal rule i showed you a moment ago uh, in the different syntaxes so you can kind of see the q radar one at the top is, is written quite a different way than the one in the the splunk and um, so it's you know, taking that and somebody can now say that will, will run in QRadar, for example, but it might not be the most efficient rule. And that's where those sort of content development specialists really come into their own and say, right, I can take this, I can work with it, I can add a few other bits and bobs. So it's speeding up their job, making sure that everything that we develop can be uh, done as quickly as possible. So we're not having to have all these silos of um, excellence across security that are doing their own thing, but not sharing this information. So it's been really, really good to Kind of push that out across BT, and it's sort of showing some value against uh, different uh, security customers. So now we've got to the state where we've uh, used threat intelligence to tell us, you know, these are the things that I should be worried about, and um, we've aligned it to MITRE attacks. We have a, a better understanding of what behaviours are being used. Um, we've looked at the indicators of compromise, and we've gone, okay, let's create some detections. And now we've created a signal rule that's allowed us to have. Um, that flexibility to deploy it to different technologies and you can go deploy that and great but the next step is you want you don't want to wait for the adversaries to attack you for those rules to go off and um, so then we need to start thinking about how do we test this stuff um, so i think as Stuart alluded to there's you know pen testing and red teaming is a really good way of sort of testing a customer's um, security defenses and, and making sure that um, you know in the most real world possible sense that you know these defenses are going to trigger when when adversaries do that so um it's a really good way of doing stuff but it might not always be the uh cheapest option to do pen test pen testing um and purple teaming etc so there are different ways of doing stuff so red canary um they have a, the atomic red team that developed a whole load of uh, atomic tests that can be run to try and emulate the behaviors that uh, an adversary might use and these are all line to mitre attack so it's quite useful that we can then say um mr customer we've deployed these rules for you and we've run this test and your uh, scene technology detected it so all's good but that can be quite a, a manual approach to it and so we start to look into different areas such as a, a breach and attack simulation so this is essentially more of a systematic approach to how you could do um, almost like a red teaming engagement. Um, so you develop those scenarios uh, around particular threat actors or particular ways malware might operate. And you say that we know from threat intelligence that you know these Russian threat actors, they'll start off with spear phishing and they move through to these different techniques um, with their end goal being they want to exfiltrate data out of your environment. Uh, so we can then develop some scenarios and, and have some tests that try to, to mimic how they would do that. Uh, and essentially you would deploy agents into, into a customer environment that replicate, uh, represent, sorry, the different devices they have available. So that could be an endpoint, it could be a server, um, it could be some other device that you know we can run the agent on. And the idea is that the agent then gets sent these scenarios and will execute those tests um, and send that information back to the breach and attack simulation technology. And then we can then feed that into their uh, scene technology and it will have a look and say, okay, you were able to detect this, you prevented these things and give them that understanding of what their defenses are capable of doing. And it's a really good way of uh, developing that benchmark because um, pen testing and red teaming can be really, really good because you're using sort of that expertise and that human knowledge to sort of, if you hit a wall, you try and figure a way of going around it. Whereas, um, which can be sometimes quite difficult to replicate, uh, definitely if somebody didn't remember exactly what they did to get past that that blocker. Whereas machines are more of a, if I can't execute it, I, I didn't execute it, I'll tell you about it. But it means that that test can be run over and over again. So we can give somebody that understanding and that benchmark to say, you know, you were detected 60% of the uh, scenarios that we developed. We're gonna run this again after we've developed some more uh, detection capability. Uh, and then see how you've improved. And then you can continuously do this uh, and looking at threat intelligence as that kind of indicator of these are the, the new trends that are happen happening in that cyberspace. Uh, how do we then make sure that those detections are working and continuously testing it uh, to make sure that we as the blue team um, 
are ready to sort of respond when that stuff happens and we're not having to spend forever developing detections it's more that moving to that proactive approach of running threat hunts and understanding what's in our environment and theorizing how an adversary might go about doing stuff uh, so that's kind of some of the stuff that we we do within the advisory space um, I'm going to stop there for questions um, when it comes to sort of the, the grad scheme and stuff because that seems to be the theme of the, the questions uh, I myself went through BT's grad scheme and I also did a year-long industrial placement and I believe they do uh, some replacements as well um, I can drop in the chat a link to our graduate page which has loads and loads of information and you'll get spammed by stuff but it's a really good place to start um, there is like a whole host of stuff that BT does in terms of, of security from security operations, pen testing, some of the stuff they do in research is insane. Um, so I think some of the stuff I've seen recently is around um, like VR socks. So having that ability to um, join a VR session and see all of that sock data and analyze it and, and manipulate it. So, um, you know, there's, don't just think as BT is, is broadband and BT sport, we do do some really cool stuff. Um, so it's definitely worth uh, checking it out. And uh, it's a really, really cool place to work and uh, pretty chill. Yeah, thank you, Chris. That was a that was a really great talk. Um, like I say, if you've got any questions for Chris, then then drop them in the chat. And just so with regards to these sigma rules, um, would you say that they're amongst sort of the top things that that I guess save you time or save save sort of uh, threat intelligence teams a lot of time? Uh, is that the main kind of uh, benefit of, of them? Yeah, I think so. And the ability to kind of is as it's starting to become more and more of a, a used across the industry, it means that we can share that information a lot easier. So, you know, in recent attacks uh, with, with SolarWinds, they developed a load of, um, it was all lined to MITRE attack as the potential um, behaviours that an adversary might use to, to exploit it. So then everyone was starting to write Sigma rules. So there's other companies that are starting to sort of do this in a, in a grand scale. So such as Sock Prime, they do it as well. So we can use that as like a, a feed to say, you know, these guys have already developed something. Can we use that to help protect our customers example, as an example? Um, and a lot of threat intelligence companies are starting to tag stuff as, as well and develop those. Um, so it does make life a little bit easier. And it does, let's say, speed things up massively because we're not having to, to write six different rules. Um, we just write the one and then we can convert it. Um, and it, you know, that build takes about 30 seconds. So it goes from having one rule to six to however many we have it configured to really. Okay, great. And um, with regards to sort of ethical hacking and things, there's a lot of uh, kind of uh, resources out there like Hack the Box and Try Hack Me and, and, and different things. Uh, but if somebody wanted to sort of use their own time to get better at threat intelligence uh, side of things, uh, what sort of resources would you point them to towards? Ooh, there's yeah, quite a lot of stuff. Um, I mean, uh, a lot of the stuff I talked about today is open source stuff. So you can um, uh, go and find Sigma's Git re GitHub repo and have a look around there. Um, a lot of the Sigma rules that get developed have sort of references to threat intelligence reports. Um, so there's some interesting stuff to read there. Uh, MITRE ATT&CK itself, uh, if you go onto their website, all of the techniques have references of you know where they've got that information from. Um, you know, there's all sorts of companies that are developing um, those sort of stuff. I think it's unit 42 is a good good website to have a play around with this sort of stuff and they're all aligned to mitre as well um, they're the ones i can remember off the top of my head okay, that's, that's great yeah thank you for that um if there's no more sort of questions for uh chris then um then i guess we could uh, wrap up but uh, do you have a, an email address chris that you're happy to take any sort of uh post event questions on uh yes i'll put it in the chat as well I say I'm on LinkedIn as well if anyone wants to sort of add and ask any questions there um, or about experiences around the, the grad scheme and stuff. Um, so yeah, more, more than happy to answer that. That's great. And definitely take advantage of, of that, guys, uh, because obviously Chris uh, and, and all the speakers here have got, you know, the, the real experience in the in the industry. So any sort of questions, um, you know, that, that sort of one-to-one one -one kind of insight can be really helpful um, uh, at times. So yeah, definitely consider that. Um, but if there's no additional questions, then um, I guess we can we can wrap up. Um, but yeah, so thank you uh, everybody for for attending, uh, and thank you to to Chris uh, and Stuart.
uh, and uh, a James from PwC as well, uh, and Dan from from Amplify, uh, for 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 joining us today to give the talks. Um, they've been really sort of insightful. Uh, the recording for for the session will be given uh, on YouTube, so that will be available within hopefully a few hours, um, and then you'll be able to sort of rewatch it if there's any sort of slides that you want to look at uh, afterwards. But uh, yeah, just sort of looking again at. Uh, share my screen. So again, just uh, just sort of remind about our, our upcoming event. So next Friday, uh, we'll have a virtual pub quiz um, with, with some prizes. Additional details of those prizes and things will be provided a little bit closer to the time. Um, but yeah, we'll be looking to do that in groups. So um, sort of tell your friends about it and sort of bring them along as well. And the week after that, uh, some of you may have already played our OSINT uh, CTF uh, type, of, type of activity. Um, but uh, a sequel to that has now been made uh, with 30 sort of OSINT um, signals intelligence and uh, a little bit of forensics as well, um, all tied into that. So that'll be run as a sort of a big group competition with some Amazon vouchers given out. So uh, keep an eye out for those details. Uh, follow us on social media if, you, um, if you're not already and you'll, you'll get the details of that as they become available. Um, but yeah, thank you everyone for, for attending. Um, you're happy to, to, to jump out of the session now um, or just sort of send us any additional questions over email and I can forward them on um, to the relevant people. Thank you, guys. If anyone's got any questions that's left, uh, you can unmute yourselves. Yes, that's no then. Cool. Yeah. Right. Thanks. Thanks all. Nice to see you, Jack. Cheers. <laughs> yeah. right. No worries. Thank you, guys. I have to have a catch up soon, mate. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. All right. Cheers. Right. Thank you. Have a nice again. Bye bye. You too. Cheers, Jack. Catch you later. Thank you. Thank you.